So as Jordan announced last week and uh, started a new series, we are going to do a series on the churches of Revelation uh, over the next seven weeks, and he kicked it off last week with an overview of where we're going, so each of us pastors are going to take different weeks to go through these, and so we've picked, and we've got a little map up there for you to see as well too, and we think that not only is this just uh, a, a good time to do this series, but also just even applicable in regards to what, uh, what the church has always faced in every age and how we see that played out in our time and age today. And so even as we're not going to necessarily do these in order, do the churches in order, and I'll say why in just a minute here, um, but as we do that, we're going to find that sometimes there are things that we would identify with the church that we're studying, and we say, hey, yes, that is us, or yeah, we need to listen and hear this. And other times there may be something where we study the church, and we may not find a lot of one-on-one -on -one correlation but they're meant to inform us and equip us so we know what are the issues at stake that matter to Jesus Christ. What are the doctrinal teachings that we need to hold on to? What are the warning signs and culture and churches facing around us? And how do we answer those who may be facing things in their community and their churches that we may not necessarily be facing, but we know why we need to continue what we're doing and why we're doing it? So as we go through these churches, that's a bit of our goal this, uh, this summer is to understand what is God's message to his church and how that, how that works for us as well too. And this morning I'm actually going to be starting at the church in Thyatira. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to Revelation chapter 2 in Thyatira. And if you're kind of wondering too, what is the strategic reason for starting with Thyatira? Because it's the fourth church in, right? And as we look at this, and I know Jordan mentioned last week that he asked Tim. Tim's going to preach on uh, Ephesus in a couple weeks here. Um, so what is the strategic reason for starting with the church of Thyatira? And it's simply this. I was very quick to pick the day that I was going to preach. I was not so quick to pick the church that I wanted to preach. And I got left with either Sardis or Thyatira. And I was like, well, all right. Flip a coin. Which one do I want? No, it was more than that. But actually, I was like, all right, here I am. I got Thyatira. And so that's why we're starting it. There's no other magical reason for that, except in God's good providence, we're starting in Thyatira. But I'm excited for Thyatira, and I hope that you will be too at the end of this morning. So this morning, as we look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 from verses 18 to 29, we're going to learn about this little church and what the city was like and the circumstances they were in. Um, there is a very specific message and theme with, the, uh, with Thyatira here, and we're going to learn about it as we go through here. But it, it did call to mind, um, thinking back through just generations of things, and as you grow up, as, both as a kid and a teenager, there are just certain, uh, there's certain words and phrases that kind of come along in each generation that just kind of mark and identify and shape kind of culture and lingo and things like that. And uh, it's always fun to think a past of like what, what things that you, if you ever look at old folks, photos of yourself, right? Uh, back from, so I'm, I grew up, I was born in the 70s, I grew up in the 80s, and my aunt, she's the youngest of eight kids, and so my aunt, who I was really close with, every once in a while on Facebook, she'll like post old throwback photos, right, of what we were like when we were like six, seven, eight years old, and I'll just say, in the 80s, whatever it was, our shorts were really short back then, like really short, like almost speedo short, and I'm like, mom, why'd you put me in that, right? And then my, and then my socks were always really high, and my hair was just always was really nerdy, I don't know, um, and uh, it was one of those things that you look back and you're like, all right, you know, and you always look back and you're like, man, I'm going to regret that hairstyle someday, and you don't realize this or not, but I actually used to have a very luscious head of hair, and I used to blow dry it and had the wave and everything, and then I got tired of doing my hair every morning for 15 minutes, I'm like, this is ridiculous, and so that's when I started shaving it. I'm not going bald or anything like that, I just started shaving it because I don't want to do my hair anymore, um, but there's also like words and language that, uh, that shape cultures well too, that kind of were in your lingo, right? So thinking back, and so it was fun, I kind of just did a little fun search of like, what are, what are words that shape culture and stuff? And in the, in a hundred years ago, in the 1920s, a hundred years ago, that's kind of weird to think to me. You know what some of the great phrases were in the 1920s? The cat's pajamas and the bee's knees. Now, I have no idea what those would have meant, except I had to look up, right? Like the cat's pajamas and the bee's knees, like half the things, the things that are like outstanding, right? Things that are excellent as well, too. The term cool started being placed in that during that time as well. Keeping up with the Joneses uh, uh, were lingos of the 40s, meaning like what were things uh, to keep up with your neighbors and how to, how to maintain a certain societal status as well. And then the 50s and 60s came along and words like hipster and groovy and daddy-o 
we're describing someone who is trend and hip uh, and an innovative person. And then you did hit the 80s, and then just words start getting made up, right? Like you just kind of start making up things and applying it. Like the word bodacious, like it doesn't, like it doesn't mean anything except that you, you throw out a word and you start saying, okay, bodacious means awesome or beautiful. Uh, you started using words like gnarly and wicked, and that I'm convinced is from New England, actually. Wicked good, right? Um, there's things that mean excellent and great. And then you hit the 90s, and you got other words like dis, like don't dis me, don't disrespect me, right? And then, man, that's really fat, but not F-A-T, right? P-H-A-T, right? So those were, that was the 90s. That was my high school year. We were apparently fat a lot in the 90s. Um, and, then, uh, and, then in the new, and then in the 2000s, things changed as well, too, and you get word like your peeps, you know, your friends. Oh, that's really sweet. In other words, that's super cool. And then someone's a noob, like a newbie, right? Uh, someone who's a newcomer, right? Someone who's, doesn't, who's uh, uh, inexperienced in what they're doing. I remember being at Christmas, and my nephew, who's like 10 years old at the time, we're playing some video game, and I'm not doing well. And he's like, yeah, you're such a noob. I'm like, what? what? Are you mocking me as a 10-year-old? Yes, I am, right? But, it, but words, have a, words have a way at which maybe you used a word or a phrase in a day and a time, and you meant one thing by that word, or a word does have a meaning, and you're using it in its proper context and meaning. But it's funny how society and culture can change the meanings of words, right? Change the applications of words. And there, there are certain words or phrases maybe that you were used, when you say it, this is what you mean, but in today's context, in day and age, it doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Or it's not taken, I should say say in the same way anymore. And we absolutely see that in our culture today. We see how words are used not only just to, not only just to maybe reshape um, a mindset a little bit, but are also meant to challenge whether it be cultural norms or also trying to redefine what it means, what this word means, or what it is that we need to get on board with and accept, right? Right? Today's words that have implication that are actually being used to try to drive a change and force affirmation of beliefs that we're not accustomed to or will not hold to are the words like tolerance, acceptance, inclusivity, and intersectionality. That those are words that are actually being used to try to reshape thinking and mindset and defining uh, whether it be gender, relationships, race, and things like that. And we're going to realize, as we even look at Thyatira, this has always been the case. These issues that we are looking at and they're new for us that are pressure-packed in our culture has actually always been the case for since the church began early on. And there is a part where we need to be able to recognize and identify, even though we may not... When we use the word tolerance, when we use the word acceptance, that there are things that come to mind, right? There are things that come to mind. If I think of the word tolerance, maybe the word lactose comes to mind. I don't know, right? There may may be things that come to your mind in regards to like, okay, this is is what I mean by it when I'm saying, and when the Bible uses those terms too, this is what the Bible is saying that they mean by it. But But there is a reality that we're not always talking the same lingo as those around us. Now, we're not meaning the same message as those who use these words. And so it's often when you say this and I say this, defining our meaning is necessary. But here's the tricky part, right? The tricky part is who defines it? Who defines those terms and how do we utilize those terms and what are they for? And if, it's, and if terms and language are subject to cultural change, then really, what's the use of language, right? What's the use of language if it can just change meaning at any point in time? And we as believers know and understand that terms and language are not defined by the the progressive change of culture. Terms and language are defined by God and his word. And even though the Bible doesn't have the word bodacious in it, I haven't found it yet. If you find it, maybe there's a new translation that has that, I don't know. But if you find it, but but the words that the Bible does use... We need to go by what script, the unchanging word of Scripture as to how it applies and what it means. And then that becomes our form of argument, right? That becomes the part like, hey, this isn't my authority. This isn't me just thinking this. This is what the Word of God says, and I, this is how I am applying it. And you and I may disagree on that, and you may get very angry at me, and you may try to cancel me or put me out or anything like that. But I am not going to compromise on the unchanging Word of God because in the end, in the end, it's whose word matters, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ's word that matters that will, that will take place. 
But like I said, this is not something new for us. This is something that has been going on for obviously centuries here. And I would say that as a church and even as Christians we face in our culture today, our battle, by the way, our struggle isn't with language. Not at all. It's not with, it's not with terms and definitions and things like that. That's not what our real struggle is. We understand and recognize that the real struggle and battle is a spiritual one. And so what we are facing here, and as we're going to really hone in on today, we're going to see the spiritual battle that is taking place in each church age culture that we need to recognize and be ready for. Uh, when Jordan gets back and when we finish this series and he gets back to Ephesians, he'll get to Ephesians chapter 6. And Paul's going to say it, and he's going to note it when he talks about even putting on the armor of God, but he says this. In Ephesians 6, verse 12, he says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So we know that what's really at stake here is the spiritual warfare that is taking place. And as we look at Revelation, we are understanding that reality of the spirit and the earthly as it's going to as it's going to combine and come in this glorious culmination at the end of age history here, where Jesus Christ does return and does fight those things and does put down our enemy, Satan. But in the meantime, we live in this tension of there's still things that are unseen, that we live by faith, but we have to recognize that we are fighting a spiritual battle and warfare here. And as we see that the message of the churches here in Revelation are Christ's message to his church, and they are real historical churches, uh, Jordan laid that out last week, they are real historical churches that had real issues, they had real people, that had real threats that they are involved with, right? But the nice thing is that we're going to see here as we go through these churches, there is this correlation of this progressive arc of church history that all churches of all ages are facing, some more at others, but really there's an intensification that takes place as we get closer to the end of Christ's return that's going on. And so the pattern of Christ's message to his churches here is one that he follows along. And Jordan noted this, and I'll just repeat it for us this morning. As we each, as we each take a week to study a, uh, study a different uh, letter to the, each city here, we're going to recognize that Christ is going to examine his churches, and under his righteous examination, that every church, every believer is subject to his authority. That really what matters is not what our culture thinks or what our culture propagates, but really what matters is what Jesus Christ says in the end. And we as believers and in his church are subject to his authority, his judgment, and his examination, which then brings about his approval is what we really desire and, and receive in him. So in this, we're going to see that there's going to be a city that's addressed. We're going to see how Christ is revealed. We're going to recognize a commendation that takes place, a criticism that he levies, and then a correction that we are to apply or the church was to apply. And like I said, that's not all necessarily one for one. And even as we look at Thyatira this morning, I don't think there's necessarily all a match, uh, match. Okay, Thyatira had this, did this, said this. Okay, we should do this, say this. Okay, this applies to us. It may not always work that way, um, but, I need, but I want us to see how, how it does matter for the churches around and what we need to be able to identify so we know what we're holding on to here and why we're not going to give in to certain things and why we're not going to deviate from certain uh, doctrines and teachings uh, theologically. That each church address is meant to warn and equip us to identify the doctrinal spiritual issues that we are similarly facing in order to stand firm for the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning in Revelation chapter 2, as we look at this, I just want to say this this morning, that we are charged by Jesus Christ to be intolerant of deviant worship by holding tightly to his truth and promises. We're going to recognize that the error of Thyatira was that they were tolerant. Tolerant Thyatira this morning. But Jesus Christ's charge to Thyatira and to us is that we actually would be intolerant of deviant worship and holding tightly to his truth and his promises this morning. So let me read for us this portion here of Thyatira starting in verse 18. Uh, it's actually the longest letter. It's the longest message that Jesus gives to the churches. And Thyatira was kind of the least of all the churches here. But this is what he writes to the, uh, to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Read it along with me in verse 18. The angel of the church in Thyatira, I write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works. 
your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this morning, Thyatira, and you can see up on our little map there, it's, it's going to be the fourth, in, uh, the fourth in a series of letters. Um, if we start with Ephesus, I know it's not highlighted there, uh, there as you can see, but there's a little bit of a horseshoe as far as uh, the letters of the churches that were addressed and how they went and how they traveled. And so Thyatira is at the top there. And um, actually just about 40 miles, uh, you can see there to the northwest there is the city of Pergamum. And then just a bit south there, you'll see is the city of Sardis. So it was right in between. It actually was it sat inside a valley. Um, Pergamum was actually the capital of the province at the time, or at least in that age. And so Thyatira was this gateway city to Pergamum, and it, and it really wasn't anything notable. It wasn't, it wasn't a strong defensive place, but they were kind of the last defense holdout to protect Pergamum in case there was an attacking army. And so it had a bit of a, it had a, bit of a garrison there. It had, it had some defense fences, but it wasn't enough to, um, to stop an onslaught if someone really wanted to come and conquer that area. They were on their way to Pergamum. They wanted to capture the capital city, and Thyatira was just the last place uh, in town before they got to Pergamum. But it was, enough of a, it was enough of a delay that if there really was an attack coming on Pergamum and Thyatira was attacked, they could warn Pergamum so Pergamum could uh, gather its forces and be ready for the attack as well. But actually it was the small city situated, and actually Pergamum and Sardis were more major cities. Obviously Pergamum was the capital of that province area, um, or at least for a time it was. It was it, those were two major cities and, per, and Thyatira was just on the way. It was noted for a lot of its trade guilds. And so if you want to think trade guilds, if you want to think of unions today in that sense as far as there was cloth making, metal working, there was uh, dyes, uh, dye manufacturing that took place as well. And so it was, there was wood making industry, a wood guild that was there. And so it was, it was a very industrious place. It actually be, then became a very commercialized place which made it very wealthy and prosperous. So even though it was just kind of a place on the way to some more important cities, but because of where it sat, it actually was was a very, it became a very industrious, commercial, prosperous place. Um, I was trying to think of a city between LA and, I don't know, San Francisco, the major cities, that's like, you know, a good-sized city, it's got good stuff in between. The best I could come up with was San Jose. I don't know, like, right, San Jose, like, you're just going on your way to San Jose. I don't know. Like, what's San Jose? There's good people from San Jose. No, I don't know. Like, what, what's one of those cities that, like, doesn't have, stand out prominently, but has, but has all that it needs as well? Um, and so here was the church of Thyatira that was uh, situated in a pretty wealthy, prosperous place. But here's what you need to know about that time as far as uh, the trade guilds and what that meant, uh, what was the organization of work and industry at that time. And each trade guild would have had a patron god or goddess. Okay, so a god or goddess that they would have sought to appease, sought to pay tribute to, sought to, you know, it was just part of the fabric. If you belonged to the, to the bronze metalworking trade guild, there was a god or a goddess that was a patron god that marked that, you know, that they were seeking the blessing and favor for their work in industry. And so inevitably in that, these trade guilds would hold these feasts and festivals and common meals for if you belonged, if you were part of this industry, 
you needed to belong to this guild, and then it was expected that you participated in these feasts and these meals. The problem with that was going to mean that it was very known that meat was sacrificed to idols which was in direct violation, not only of previous commands, but specifically in Acts 15. When the church was meeting together, when Gentile converts were coming to the, uh, be, uh, being converted to the church, and Paul and, and Paul and Silas are out ministering and sharing, and there was the struggle between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and Jewish Christians are saying, you need to hold to the law, you need to hold to the commandments, you need to adopt these things, you need to be circumcised, and Paul's saying, wait, 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 like, no, that's not, that's not the deal here. That's not, what's, that's not what the Lord has commanded us. And the church in Jerusalem gathered together, they evaluated the situation, and they said this, look, keep yourself pure for the Gentile Christians, and for really all Christians, but in the church, we're just going to say two things. You don't need to keep the law. Like Christ came and abolished the law. But what you do need to do is keep yourself pure and don't eat food sacrificed to idols. So it was a clear, direct command from God and through the church that they were not to, in good conscience, eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. But if you belong to a trade guild, it was going to be expected that you participate in that, right? And what would have followed, especially in those things too, and you can imagine at these feasts and festivals and meals that took place, that not only was there meat uh, being sacrificed to idols that you would have been expected to eat and participate with, but also it just... It just lent itself to drunkenness, right? And then drunkenness leads to debauchery, and then it leads to slack morality. And so it was not a good setup for anyone who was involved in these things. If you were not part of a guild, then your business would suffer. If you did not belong to one of these industries and one of these marketplaces in this way, you can expect that you would have been considered an outcast in that city, in that region, because you were not going along with what was expected. And for believers in Thyatira, that was the struggle. How do you, as a believer in this age, how do you in this culture maintain a good witness and testimony, follow the will of God, follow his commands, but not compromise on his revealed word? And if you chose not to join a guild or chose not to participate in the activities of that guild, then you risked losing business association. You risked the loss of business partnership. You risked losing your reputation in the city and then thereby probably suffering your livelihood, right? Could you stay operating business in Thyatira if you didn't participate in these things? And that was the tension for the believers at that time as to do I join these things and abstain knowing that it will cost me business and livelihood? Or... Do I, do I just at least go along with some of it? I'm not going to do all of it. I'm not going to really buy into it. I'll just do it outwardly, but that way I can maintain my relationship with my, with my, my coworkers here and maintain a good witness and testimony for Jesus Christ, but not, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just compromise this much. And that was part of the issue that Thyatira was facing. There is one famous person that we know from Thyatira. She was a woman. She was a businesswoman. She sold purple, purple dye, and her name was... There you go, Lydia, right? In Acts chapter 16, we meet Lydia, the first convert in this area with Paul that she met at the riverbanks of Philippi. So we know that she was part of, she was part of the dye industry, a very wealthy woman. She goes to Philippi. It says that she was a worshiper of God. So she knew who, she had heard of who God was, but at, at the riverbanks of Philippi, she meets Paul and Silas. Paul shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with her. She becomes saved. Her household is saved and baptized. Maybe Paul and Silas went with her to Thyatira and met with her household there and baptized. And it's very likely that probably the church in Thyatira started with Lydia and started with Lydia's household. So she is definitely a prominent one we want to remember here. The issues of Thyatira facing the Thyatira church are a sober warning for any church age facing the pressure to compromise in a culture of tolerance and approval. And so as we look here, we're going to see what's going to be revealed to us. Let's look first about Christ. What is Christ when he gives this message here and what he reveals about himself here? It says this, and this reminds us of actually just over in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, when John looked and saw Christ, 
This is who he saw. He said he saw the one who had eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. There's someone else who saw this as well, too. Centuries earlier, the prophet Daniel, as he received revelation from God, in Daniel chapter 10, he saw the pre-incarnate Christ, and he describes it this way in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. He said his body was like beryl. That was a, that was a, um, a precious stone and jewel. His face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. This is who Christ has always been. Do you re- did you realize and catch that? That before he came to earth and as a baby in Jesus, that he has always been this being. That when Daniel saw him in his pre-incarnate state, was revealed to him, that is what Christ truly looks like and is. He came to earth, he, he laid aside his glory while he was here on earth and ministering and sacrificing himself for us and being raised again. And then when he returned to heaven and returned up to the right hand of the seat of God, he took back on all his glory and this is what he looks like. And all these things are significant as to who he is and what he does. His eyes, like the flame of fire, help us understand that it is Jesus Christ's eyes that pierce and recognize, examine the righteous, his, uh, it's a a righteous examination of our hearts and our minds. That his feet of bronze, they, 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 they symbolize the sovereignty and the execution of judgment that God has upon the nations and his people here. That Jesus Christ's eyes pierce through to the inner core of your being to search and reveal the motives that are unseen by others. And his feet enforce God's powerful judgment. So everyone falls under the authority and judgment of God, right? Everyone's going to fall under the authority and judgment of God. But Jesus Christ is primarily concerned with his church. Jesus Christ is primarily concerned with his people. And even as we read this letter, we need to take that. We need to take that personally to extent, right? We need to recognize that if we're in this church, we're saved by Jesus Christ, that this is what Jesus Christ is looking at and what he expects and what he's examining here. Now, being examined is not super fun, right? Like, if you ever sit down for a job performance review, um, if you get to go in for maybe some marriage counseling as well, too, if you got to take school exams, those guys finishing an exam, like, it's not fun to be examined, right? It's not fun to be scrutinized. Um, it's not fun to maybe walk through that process. Eh, maybe fun's not the right word, but you know what I mean, right? Like, so no one's always asking for those things and stuff, but they're necessary, right? They're, they're necessary uh, to, to do assessment, to do evaluation, for affirmation as well, too. You and, and, and moving on, um, but it's 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 uncomfortable. It's it's not really it's not really thing like you want to necessarily invite in. I told you this week I had to go to the doctor, right? It's just a once an exam. It wasn't anything specific. It's my yearly exam type of thing and stuff. And he's you know asking the general questions of things. Yep, yeah, no, okay, I'm better this year. Okay, I got to check my cholesterol. Shoots a little higher than it was. All right, you know, do these things. And he says, well, I got some good news and I got some not so good news. And like. If there's anything you want to hear from the doctor, it's like, eh, I got some not-so-good news for you. All right, doc, what do you got for me, right? He says, well, the good news is we're not doing, um, <clears throat> we're not doing prostate exams the same frequency anymore. That's okay. That is great news, actually, right? Sure. I don't mind that. He's like, you know, we're checking, you're checking all these markers of things. We're not going to do that for you right now. Excellent. Thank you. He said, the not-so-good news is, uh, he said, um, colonoscopies have lowered the age from 50 to 45. Um, You're 46. Yes, doctor, thank you for noting that as well too. But you got a choice here. He said you can, um, you can once every 10 years um, have it scoped, uh, um, or every three years you can submit a sample. Ugh, right? And I said, well, thanks, Doc. Um, let me take those under consideration, and um, we'll, go, we'll go from there, right? Um, going to the doctor, by the way, is very intrusive. Um, it's very, um, uh, you know, it's pretty uncomfortable, and I'll just say it's rather embarrassing, right? It's pretty, it's pretty embarrassing. You're pretty vulnerable there as well, and I'm a guy. Sorry, ladies. But, like, it's pretty vulnerable. Like, it's one of those ones that you're like, I don't really want to do this, but I know that I need it. You, we, we do these things, we do these treatments examinations for prevention, right? We do it for preventative care. We do it for assessment. We do it for diagnosis um, so that we can either be warned and, and head something off early or if there really is an issue that shows up, then what is the right treatment that needs to be applied so that it be, can, can be corrected? 
When Jesus Christ examines, it's going to be intrusive. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be embarrassing. But it's necessary for the assessment, the diagnosis, and the application of what needs to be corrected here, right? Um, so understand that when Jesus Christ does this, it's not just because he doesn't do a performance evaluation, right? Jesus Christ isn't your boss in the sense of he's like, sit down, okay, good, you brought in this many cells this year, you did this type of thing, great, great here, you know, maybe fix this here, add this team member here. That's not what Jesus Christ is interested in. He's not interested in a performance review. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in, in what's going on in your inner being, in your core. What's the motives in your mind and in your soul and your will. He doesn't separate it out. Doesn't say, all right, good job here, good job here. You got all A's here. Uh, you got an F here, but we'll let these outweigh the F. No, no, no. Like that matters. Like it all plays together. And receiving and understanding, coming under the scrutiny of Jesus Christ means that we are willingly putting ourselves under his examination. We need to hear both the good and the bad. But I'll say this. When he examines us, right, he doesn't just walk away and say, yeah, good luck with all that. No, he actually, he actually has in his mercy and his kindness the right treatment for us. And it's actually a merciful thing of Jesus Christ that he does in applying his grace for your good so that you can receive the correction needed to be most pleasing and honoring to him. I think of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, they're really, when talking about the word of God, it is Jesus Christ, but 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How does Jesus Christ primarily examine us? He primarily examines us through his word. And if you're not in his word, you're not under the scrutiny of Jesus Christ to change you for your good, to receive his grace applied to you. Let's look at what the Jesus commended for this church, right? Jesus commended for this church in verse 19. He says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, that your latter works exceeded the first. Here was the great thing about Thyatira. They were doing great things. And they actually were getting better at what they were doing, right? He says, I know your deeds. I know your works. And here it was. And they actually were practicing. They were growing in love. They were growing in faith. They were growing in service. They were growing in patient endurance. Their ministry was flourishing. Maybe in that area, maybe because of the economy, maybe because of the wealth of the, of the believers there, they were probably able to uh, take on and initiate many ministry opportunities. That maybe they really were meeting the needs of the poor, not just within the church there, but maybe in the community there. That they had enough to be able to share with others. Maybe they really were intentionally gathering and coming alongside with one another, and, it, and not only just it, it, as far as in loving one another, but in, in, in being able to just, maybe just in fellowship and friendship with one another. They were doing really good things. They were doing really great things. Kind of opposite of Ephesus a little bit, that was really good at what they saw and what they could identify and what they would not do, but Ephesus was lacking in its love. Here, they actually were showing great love, but they're going to lack in their discernment, which is a dangerous combo here. But it is a mark of a healthy church, right? That our, that our church should, continuing, should continue to grow in ministry, ministry of service, ministry of faith and love. That churches that die, die because somewhere in there, not only is their love grown cold, but then even their works of service start to, to, to diminish. Whether maybe it's, it's just the congregation is aging and maybe the people don't have the same quite energy they used to before. Uh, maybe it's just a part that they've done their time and they've gotten a little tired and they just need a break. I just need a break right now. Maybe things aren't in order quite and they're, you know, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I get married. I'm going to wait until we, my, my, I've settled my job. I've got a couple years of savings here done. I'm going to wait until uh, we just had kids. So we're going to wait until our kids are an older age where we can actually start participating in the service. I'm going to wait until we, we, we just moved. I've got to wait until we're, not, we're, done, we're un, done unpacking. But the problem is if you're always waiting for the right time, it's never going to come, right? It's never going to happen. You don't, you don't wait, you don't resign your post, you don't retire from it, you don't, um, you don't take a longer extended break 
that ministry not only is always there, but always needs to increase. So are you increasing in your ministry or have you been backing out? And here's the thing, and identifying ministry as well too, the way that that happens, and we'll get to this even in Ephesians 5, it's walking by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit in faith and in love. And if you're walking by the Spirit, the Spirit will reveal to you the opportunities of influence around you that you see and identify and start serving and ministering to. So to increase in our ministry. But there was a big problem with Thyatira. And the problem is this. In fact, their great things for God, their great ministry works for God could not outweigh this glaring this glaring lack of holiness in the church. And it was their tolerance of sexual impurity and deviant worship. Uh, when Marshall preaches on Pergamum, you're going to see it's actually flipped, where we're going to see that they had deviant worship that's led to sexual immorality. We're going to see here in Thyatira that actually it's sexual immorality coupled with deviant worship here. And it seems that there was this prominent woman in the church who had deceived. She called herself a prophetess. And prophetess is something both in the Old and New Testament, a, a messenger, teacher uh, of the words of God in this context of things. But she took on that title maybe to give herself a place, a position of influence. Maybe she was very persuasive. Maybe she was a very talented teacher, right? And so she had this prominent role. If, if Thyatira was started by Lydia, obviously maybe women played a larger role in the church there as far as uh, influence and opportunity that were taking place. And there was this one lady that had that, and in her teaching, though, in her teaching, she taught things that were contrary to the revealed will of God. In fact, Jesus is going to give her a certain label that is going to conjure up some pretty uh, hefty, um, hefty judgment. Like I said, Thyatira, they showed great love and good service, but they lacked discernment. They demonstrated poor discernment. If you ever read any of Warren Wearsby, former uh, pastor, who's passed away, but a lot, author of a lot of Christian commentaries and Bible studies, he made this quote one time. He said, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. So their inability to identify a false teacher and to deal with this directly led to a dangerous compromise in the church. Um, there are certain... There's certain baby names that um, parents tend to shy away from, right? Um, Gertrude, probably not, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe that, that, that could fit in some kind of, Homer, that's probably, that's probably not a name you want to name your kid. Adolf, I don't think that's off the table as well, too. Um, Jezebel is going to be one of those names, right? Like, I haven't known anyone in my lifetime who named their child Jezebel, maybe like a hairless cat, you know, I don't know, type of thing that's really kind of honoring. Um, it's not a name that you really apply to um, those things um, because sometimes, and it's funny, I mean, it doesn't have to be those names. I remember when we were talking through names, baby names, stuff like that, there was, we come up with a name and like, oh, isn't the name of a former boyfriend? Yep, that's off the table. We're not doing that one, right? Like you have reasons for why you don't name your kids certain things just because it conjures up certain men uh, uh, memories and things like that. Jezebel, however, is a name whose legacy lives on, Right? She's not just a famous name, she's the infamous name, right? She's the one who was married, just to jog your memory a little bit here, I won't spend a lot of time on her, but just jog your memory, she was the wife, she was a Sidonian princess, so she wasn't even Jewish. Ahab, the King Ahab of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, making a treaty, but reached out and married this, uh, this, uh, the Sidonian uh, uh, king's daughter, and so Jezebel is incorporated into the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, under Ahab. And together, they were this um, awful dynamic duo, right? Um, here's what God indicts about Ahab in uh, 1 Kings chapter 16 when he says, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than who were all before him. So he's already a pretty bad, wicked guy, right? And then, she, and then God says this, and, is it, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Nebat, uh, Nebat, Nebat, there we go, anyways. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So it joins this, and here's what you, I'll just summarize Jezebel for you here. I mean, she had no care or love for, for the one true God. In fact, 
what's going to be pointed out in the life of Jezebel, it was part of her ambition and motive to eradicate all worship of Yahweh. Like it, it was her intent to eliminate, and eventually her granddaughter, Athalia, also carried on this mission to eradicate all worship of the one true God. And she did that first by introducing Baal worship into, into Israel. And with Baal worship, you also need to know as well, too, that was the cow, right? That was the one that, was, um, uh, that came up prominently and stuff. Um, it was also a very sexually deviant, immoral style of worship. And so how do you entice people? How do you entice people to adopt a new way of worship, to accept and to follow? You seduce them immorally, and you deceive them to saying, this is okay to accept. And actually, this is another God that we need to appease and participate with. Whoever the lady was in Thyatira, her name most likely was not Jezebel, um, but whoever she was, her motives or intentions were similar fashion to what the real Jezebel did as well. Um, a former pastor, Lehman Strauss, says this about this part here and, and recognizing these two women here. He says, just as Jezebel on Elijah's day took the lead in changing the religious doctrines and deeds of the people, so the self-styled prophetess in Thyatira boldly taught her nefarious philosophy, I like that word, nefarious philosophy, with little or no opposition. See, what you do is you begin to whether, and, 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 and it doesn't tell us how it is that she incorporated these things, right? And that's not the point. But what you understand is like, okay, with that, the, that the tolerance came from within the church, and there was this subtle introduction that took place, and so what do you do is you start incorporating and you start normalizing these things. And it would have been very enticing for the Christians in Thyatira to, you can imagine the conversation, should, should Christians in Thyatira, should they participate in these things? Well, look, here's the deal. Like, if you don't, it's going to cost you your business. If you don't, you're going to be considered an outcast. Your family may even reject you as well, too. So here's, 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 here's what you can do. Where's the line? Here's what we're going to say, right? Look, go to the feast. Go to the feast. But in your heart, you know, don't worship Baal. But, but go to the feast and just sit there and, and maybe have something to eat. Maybe, maybe take a drink, but don't get drunk, right? Type of thing. Like, okay, like, like, like just, just, just put on the show, but really in your heart, don't, you know, don't adopt that. But we know how the game's played, right? We know how the game's played. That when we invite ourselves into a company or when we're faced with the pressure of like, man, if I don't do this, this is what's going to cost me, then like, I'm just going to go and do this far and then be okay with it. You know, and then step, and then step away. I know when to step away. But the problem is, then the next feast comes, right? And the next enticement comes. The next seduction comes. And you go a little bit farther the next time. And you get a little more comfortable. And what you realize, and before you, before you maybe even can recognize it, is that it starts becoming a, normaliz a normalization within your lifestyle. Things that you watched, things that you watch now, you previously wouldn't have watched a few years ago because, because well, I watched the show, I really liked it. I had a little bit of this, but it's, you know, okay, I'll stop, but, but, but hey, this is a really good show, but it has all this in it. Or, hey, this group of people, they're not bad, I, I, I need to reach them for the gospel, so I'll go out with them after work. And, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll spin, but I won't. I'll be the designated driver, right? Until you're not, right? And so you can see how there's this, there's this, this deceit that took place in play and where it got comfortable with it. And, and by the way, we're going to see that not everyone in the church was comfortable with this. Not everyone in the church was practicing this, but there was enough in the church and this lady had a influence and reputation in the church that it was not a secret. It was very well known. It was very well known and not addressed and I'd say that's the sad thing about Thyatira and this adopting of worldly standards and accommodating certain lifestyles that were expected that they let down their guard, that they were no longer discerning, and they allowed it to take place that really at the heart was corrupting, was corrupting the people and corrupting their worship. How does that happen, right? How does a church that seems very um, 
uh, uh, very ministry-minded, uh, very, uh, very thriving in their community, um, that, are taking, that are doing a lot of great things, but there is a glaring thing within that is compromising its, its, its morals, compromising its values. How does that actually happen? It's a little bit, or a lot of, believing the lie that you can have the best of both worlds without consequences, right? Like, hey, I can participate and be a part of this, of this group of things. I can have one foot here and gain the advantages that come along with it, but I am also gonna stay and be a part of these things that God offers and receive all the blessing that he has as well too, right? And it's straddling this line and saying, look, when I need to be, I'll, I'll lean over here, but then I'm gonna go back over here. And, and we think that we can play this game where we can actually live in both worlds. Jesus calls it out and says, you can't serve two masters. Paul's going to identify it in Galatians chapter 6 when he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The lie leads to not taking God's word seriously. The lie leads to not believing that the word of God is authoritative and sufficient and speaks to all things. Because if you sell out there, then it's a quick path to like, ah, but that doesn't, really, that doesn't really apply to me at this time. And when you stop taking God's word seriously and authoritatively, then what you do is you stop confronting sin. You stop identifying confronting sin in your own heart and also within the church. And notice when Christ calls out the church here, they did not confront this woman when they should have. For our church to remain healthy, for our church to make sure, and I'm not saying this like that we don't go the path of other churches. It's not that. This is an examination in part for our church that we do not believe the lie that we can live in the best of both worlds, but that we continue to take the word of God seriously, authoritatively, and sufficiently, and that we're also willing to call out sin when it's necessary. And that's the uncomfortable part. Right? It's uncomfortable when Christ examines us. Who does he use? He uses each other. He uses us. And Paul saying, Galatians, look, you who are spiritual, and he's not saying spiritual leaders. He's saying, look, if there's a brother or sister caught in sin, you who are spiritual, go to that person. In other words, if you're not caught in sin right now and you see this, go to your brother, go to your sister. It's actually the loving, gracious thing to do. It's actually a kind mercy of God when those things are exposed to us. And sometimes, actually a lot of the times, he uses each other, he uses us with each other so that we can express and show the love and care and concern for one another. And there's this amazing thing that happens. It actually deepens our relationship. You do run the risk, and this has happened in plenty, you do run the risk that that person doesn't like it, they're upset with it, they're upset with you, they turn on you, and they won't, and you lose that relationship. There is that risk, and that will happen and that's on them. But there's actually the greater joy when you win your brother, when you win the person and you deal with it. And they may not like it and they may not even like you and they may even hate you in the moment. But as you work through the process, as they come back, you work through those things together. You're not alone. And you're actually your relationship and your growth in Christ grows greater together. Jesus gave an expiration date on this woman. Um, he says that he was going to, he offered her a time to repent. She refused to repent of her sexual morality. He was going to throw her onto a sick bed. And I think that means exactly what it means. Whatever was going on with her, she was going to con contract whatever it was and she was going to die a pretty sick, a pretty sick death. He gives an offer of repentance to those who were following after her, a chance to turn, a chance to not go down her path of things. And why is Christ so severe in this? Why does, he, why does he give such a harsh judgment? And why, by the way, in his grace and his offer for repentance, there is a point where that offer is taken off the table, that there is an offer of repentance, but it was not there all the days of her life. And I think specifically, too, I think definitely when it deals with sexual immorality, and especially in the life of the church and the holiness of the church, Jesus Christ doesn't tolerate that. 
he doesn't tolerate that. And I think that there is a time of expiration of people, and, spe- and particularly spiritual leaders that are involved in, in sexual immorality to some degree, that there comes a time where that offer of, of repentance is taken off the table, and they receive the results of their consequences. But until that time, the offer of repentance is still on the table, and Jesus Christ offers it here. And why is it so serious? And I'm not going to... I'm not going to say a whole bunch uh, in regards to this, but I just want to note, actually, look with me, if you will, in verse 24, when he's actually commending them for not holding his teaching, he says, what, and he describes it this way, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Why, what is it really rooted in? It's actually rooted in a satanic, demonic theology, right? Deviant worship, sexual morality within that part comes by the devices of Satan. He's been doing that since the beginning, right? Why does Satan always, ta- what does Satan continually attack? He attacks worship and he attacks intimacy. He attacks, he attacks our worship with one another. He attacks sexual purity within, within, a, within a congregation and culture, within a marriage, right? That's what he's often after because one, those things actually were created as good in the garden before the fall, but two, it's also the part where he can often get a foothold into our hearts and into our lives that he is often after. And Jesus here is pointing out her teachings, her teachings are actually rooted, this type of teaching is actually rooted in Satan and his deception. So that's why the punishment is so severe, that Jesus Christ is jealous for your holiness He's jealous for your personal purity, and he wants you to be pure and holy before him. He will not tolerate deviant worship or immorality. Uh, One more quote here by uh, by an author and a commentator. He says this. He says, here's a warning. A church which is crowded with people and which is a hive of energy is not necessarily a real church. It is possible for a church to be crowded because its people come to be entertained instead of instructed and to be soothed instead of confronted with the fact of sin and the offer of salvation. It may be a highly successful Christian club rather than a real Christian congregation. He wrote that back in 1976. I think it still applies today. Well, what does Christ offer? And here's the hope, right? What does Christ offer? He offers a correction. And actually, I want you to see in this, because I'll say this. I think these issues of tolerance, compromise, acceptance are what we feel probably the most in, 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 our, in our context today as well, too. And it's just, it's just unrelenting, isn't it? Like, it's unrelenting and it's exhausting, I have like a seven minute commute from here to my house. And I'm usually the guy, I like to listen to talk radio. I'm usually listening to sports radio. Um, I'm usually listening to something like that. I'll switch over to the news, KFI, get the, or not the KFI, the, uh, what's the other one? 1070, KNX, there you go. I'll get the top highlights of things and stuff like that. It's not a long commute. I'm listening to about four minutes to sports radio. I'm listening to the last two to three minutes to you know, news radio, things like that. And I'll just say in the last few weeks, every time, and I don't turn it on every day. Every time I, I'm driving by, in those two to three minutes, there is an agenda of a topic of conversation that is taking place. And I just, and I listen for about 90 seconds, and I'm like, I'm tired of this, right? 90, I can't even stand 90 seconds of it. It's just constant. It's unrelenting. All the things that are continuing to be pushed, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Because you feel like you always have to be on your guard. And to be honest, sometimes you're tired, And I think that's what happens as well, too. Sometimes you're tired and you let down your guard. And I want you to see here, actually, what Christ says to this church, because I think it's very gentle and very merciful and very hopeful. Note this. When he says in verse 24, to the rest of you who do not hold to this teaching, so he makes the observation there. He knows that not everyone in this church is doing this practice, has compromised. He knows that there are a remnant in the church that is seeking to be faithful, but it is hard and it is pressure packed. And I love how he says this. Look at, look at the end of verse 24. He says this, I do not lay any other burden. I don't lay any other weight. That is a very gentle, merciful thing of God. He doesn't tell them to do more things. 
He actually doesn't tell them to grow greater in ministry. He doesn't tell them, hey, fix this over here and start doing this over here. They were already doing enough. And he doesn't tell them to do more. He actually says, you don't need to do any more. I'm not going to lay any other weight upon you. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, do you remember what Jesus said, that those who follow him, his yoke is what? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Here's what you need to know about your Savior. He is very gentle. He is very gracious towards his people. And he doesn't make the task of being a follower of Jesus Christ this hard, weighty thing that he has put on you. He actually enables you to walk when you're exhausted, to be faithful and spirit-filled when you don't think you can be. And he says, I don't lay any other burden on you. And then he gives this, he gives, he quotes Psalm 2 here when he says, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. He actually gives them the hope of saying, it will end. And all those parts where you feel like you're under the gun, where you feel like you're under the pressure, where you feel like you're the one have been conquered, you're the one that is is suffering in these things, that will end when he returns and you actually will be placed in a position of exaltation. You will be placed in a position of actually a shepherd ruler with Jesus Christ. See, the neat thing about this psalm, in Psalm 2, we know it's a messianic psalm applied to Jesus Christ when he returns and he will put down the nations and he will rule with righteous judgment and his rod and his staff. But Jesus here gives that application that was meant for him in Psalm 2, he gives it to us, the church. He says, look, the Father has given me this authority and I am actually sharing and delegating that authority of rulership to you. You will reign with me. You will rule with me. And it won't be a burden. And it won't be their winning. It'll be I won and you're with me. It's a sweet, sweet promise that makes us hope for Jesus Christ's return and longing that if you're feeling low and outcast now, that one day you will belong. You do belong to Jesus Christ and you will belong and have a position in his kingdom that is a shepherd ruling position. It's a sweet, sweet promise that he gives. But there's something even better, and I'll close with this. He says there at the end, verse 29, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse uh, 28, and I will give him the morning star. It's a reference to an Old Testament passage in Numbers, but actually it's later identified at the end of Revelation in in chapter 22, verse 16, when Jesus says these words, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. What does Jesus Christ give in the end to those who hold fast and endure? He gives us himself. See, the great hope and promise is that you have Jesus Christ. You have him now and you have him for eternity. The charge to hold fast, to hold tightly to our doctrinal teachings, to what the church is, to not give in to deviant worship, to stay sexually pure, to maintain holiness within our church is not just being conquerors and rulers with him, but is actually the greatest reward of receiving Jesus Christ himself one day. Does that that like excite your heart that that is our hope and that is our promise? Which then in turn means this. It makes us cry out with John, Jesus Christ, come back and come back now.
right? It makes us in our hearts like, as much as we're done with living in this society and culture, obviously it's not time's up yet, and he's giving us his spirit to enable to live, but it does make us look and realize that our hope is not now. Our hope is not only just what is to come, but who is to come, and it's that person, Jesus Christ, that he is our future hope because he is our future grace in all these things. And at the end of chapter 22, at the end of Revelation, when John says this, when Jesus gives this promise, surely I am coming soon, John echoes it and says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That is where we keep our eye in order not to fall into deviant worship and to not be tolerant of those things, but to hold fast and hold tightly to the truth and promises of God.